And as I always say, they have a mind of their own. If they do ring, if you'll step out into the corridor, then you can answer it, and you can certainly come back in. And um, this morning, we're going to ask Commissioner Gibson, if he will, to stand and lead us in the invocation and pledge of allegiance to the Delta State Missouri. Chair, I want to yield. Scott, morning, let him bring us up. All right. Brother John, if you don't mind. Thank you for the invitation. You'll bow with me. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning acknowledging thy name is holy and reverent. Every good and every precious gift comes from you. We're thankful for the gift of life that we've already experienced this morning. We thank you, Father, that we can stand rest assured that your mercies are new, your faithfulness is great, and your compassions fail not. We're thankful, Lord, that we can come this morning in this format to conduct the affairs of this beautiful county in which we're blessed to live. We thank you for our home here, our friends here, our family that's here. We thank you for our employment with this county and the opportunity to serve those who live here. We pray that each of us would be faithful in the discharge of our responsibilities and that, Lord, we might uh, one day hear from thee, well done. And until then, Lord, we pray for your sustaining grace each day of our life. We pray for our troubled nation. We pray for the election which is upcoming, that it would be peaceful, that Father, that all men everywhere would vote their conscience as they see fit, and the Lord, that we might see peaceful times throughout this election to come. We pray, Father, that this meeting this morning might be done in decency and in order. We pray also, Lord, this morning especially for those that are suffering, either recovering or under the diagnosis of COVID, we pray, Lord, that soon this cloud would be removed from us and that we might call upon your name for forgiveness of our sins as a people. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to serve you. We're thankful for those who serve our country, whether they're home or deployed. We pray for their soon and safe return, and not them only, but also their families who are many times left lonely because of their departure. We pray for our public safety officers who serve each day that we might rest peacefully at night we pray for their protection and their safe return to their families as well. Now, Lord, be with us through the discharge of this day. And when we lay our heads down tonight, may we say that we have walked with God today. In the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
and Boy Scouts, we do many service projects. We go camping, we learn survival tricks, and we do cons. Cons. Cons and cons and cons and cons. <laughs> I have even done a mile swim at Black Creek Scout Reservation in Sylvania, Georgia. Top of that is right here. I was the youngest person in my group to do the small swim. I am here for a requirement for the citizenship and the community merit badge. It is Eagle required. My goal is to get my Eagle Scout rank and get a scholarship for college to attend law school and go into politics. Did you know that there is a scholarship merit badge? I'm asking y'all a question. <laughs> uh, who has gotten the Eagle Scout rank in Boy Scout? Oh, you yeah. know, nice. Good job. How mm -hmm. did you feel like <laughs> when you got it? That was a good experience. And a lot of friends helping and myself would see it too. So. Okay, nice. Eagle Scout rank is a very good thing to have on a job resume. Thank you for having me here. Most people my age don't get the opportunity to come back to communities like this. I am very grateful for your time. Thank you. Now, before you sit, sit down, I wanted to share this with you. That was a pleasure for us. I made a comment to him a few minutes ago. I didn't know what he was going to say or, or get up and possibly get up and say nothing. But uh, I did say he may become the next <clears throat> a president of the United States in the future. You know, I think he may have a possibility to do that. You have done a super job. Now I'm going to ask you to do one other thing, like we often do. Uh, the commissioners have gotten together a little bag <clears throat> bag for you that I will present to you and I'm going to come down we're going to have a picture made and then I'm going to ask the commissioners to like here and, and uh, to stand up here behind us so they can get their picture in this also okay <clears throat> Um, I believe you have a video, Andy, that you're going to show. 
All right, we'll show it now. <clears throat> Proclamation and 
then we'll present it to Joy Deal. Whereas the city has the Bullitt County Board of Commissioners stand firmly committed to the quality to quality after school programs and opportunities because they provide safe, challenging, and engaging learning experiences that help children develop social, emotional, physical, and academic skills. Support working families by ensuring that children are safe, productive after the regular school day ends. Build stronger communities by involving students, parents, business leaders, adult volunteers in the lives of young people, thereby promoting positive relationships among youth, families, and adults. Engage families, schools, and community partners in advancing the welfare of the children. Whereas Statesboro Board Parks and Rec Department has provided significant leadership in the area of community involvement in the education and well-being of our youth, grounding in the principles that quality after-school programs are key to helping our children become successful adults. Whereas lights on after school, the national celebration of after school programs held this year on October 22nd promotes the importance of quality after school programs in the lives of children, families, and communities. Whereas more than 28 million children in the United States have parents who work outside the home and 19.4 million children have no place to go after school. Whereas many after school programs across the country are facing funding shortfalls so severe that they are being forced to close their doors and turn off their lights. Therefore, be it resolved that the Bullock County Board of Commissioners urge the citizens of Bullock County to ensure that every child has access to a safe, engaging place where lights are on after school. And be it further resolved that the Bullock County Board of Commissioners enthusiastically endorse lights on after school and is committed to the innovative after school programs and activities that ensure that the lights stay on and that the doors stay open for all children after school. And witness thereof, we have here set forth our hand and call the seal of Bullock County Board of Commissioners to, to be affixed this 20th day of October. Thank you very much. Ms. Dill, would you come up now? And myself and Ms. Gaines are going to come around. We're going to have a seat for Mason. The other commissioners will go over just like the board. see on the agenda next would be Dr. Calvin Jackson, but he just called up and he just asked that he be removed and we'll move him to a future date. So we're going to move next to a legislative report by Senator Billy Hickman. And Billy, I think you have seen some future opposition uh, this morning already in Mr. Finley. So, uh, but if y'all will give Mr. Billy your attention, he'll give us a legislative report. Well, good morning. It is uh, with great pleasure that I'm here today. Uh, this will not be a legislative report because it's a little bit, but uh, the main thing I want to do is uh, come and talk to y'all and then just because technically, you know, we're kind of in a no man's zone right now with uh, with legislators not even meeting. But uh, but uh, I want to first of all thank y'all for allowing me to be here today. Uh, it's a great opportunity for, for me to, to, uh, to talk to y'all. And I also want to thank y'all for electing, electing us to this uh, state senate seat. Uh, I made it look loud. Uh, I, I, I told I met Jack Hill's sister a couple of weeks ago, and I told her, I said, the greatest thing about this seat is following in the steps of Jack Hill. The worst thing about this seat 
It's all in itself. You got healed. I've never met a, I've never met a person in my life that had many friends that Jack Hill had. He just had the ability to do that for people and make people feel like that. But I'll, first of all, I'll, uh, talk a little bit about what some other things. I want to, I want to um, thank our Governor Brian Kemp for reaching out and being the leader that he has been through this pandemic. You think about where, where our state is versus a lot of other states. Brian stepped up, made some, made some difficult decisions, and still making difficult decisions, and uh, consequently our state is doing real well. You know, he, through, um, through his leadership, Brian was voted to uh, give an A plus by the Wall Street Journal back several uh, months ago now. And, um, and I think he was on like four or five, maybe six governors in, in the United States that had that A plus rating. But you know, by, by, by taking uh, measures and, and that, they, data, data and data, data uh, driven approaches, we kept our economy strong and we see our economy strong in Boca County. Um, not what we want it to be, obviously, but stronger than we could have been. We just shut down like so many states shut, shut things down. And boy, we were just so fortunate that y'all had the vision to do that along with Tom's leadership and the city to take those top opportunities for us to stay open. Um, but you know, we, we got a lot of common sense. You know, everybody in this room today has got masks on. That doesn't offend anybody. That's just the way of life right now. We just need to be, be used to it. But you, if you look at our state in August of uh, 2020, uh, net tax revenues over August of 2019 was up 7.7%. Hard to imagine during the pandemic tax revenues being up, but it was. That, that's a test for leadership. Um, they uh, also found out another day that, uh, that there have never been as many uh, different companies looking at the state of Georgia as they are right now. And 30% of those jobs are looking outside the Atlanta area. Unemployment right now in Georgia is 5.6%. Our nation average is up eight point four percent, so we're significantly less than than nation average. But I want us to think about our future, and I want us to think about not the people. In, well, maybe one person in this room, but I want us to think about our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, and that's that's where I'm going to kind of get on with our talk right now. Um, I, I, one of the first things I want to do, though, in working with y'all, and I've told this to other cities and counties, I want to do everything possible to fulfill the legacy of Jack Hill. If Jack Hill was working on something for the city of Statesboro, Bullock County, I want to work with Tom, and I want to work with y'all to make sure that that gets fulfilled. You know, we just cannot let a person that did as great a job as Jack Hill did for our community just kind of go to the wayside. Um, and, and, and we just need to keep that keep that in mind. You know, when I when I think about our communities and and, and, Roy, I, and, and, and Walter, a lot of the stuff I want to talk about, I, I learned through the campaign because me like a lot of y'all, you know, you look in this room this morning, we're all you know dressed well, we look good, we're pretty, you know, all that kind of stuff. But you know, that's really not like that in a lot of our counties, and it's not like that in our county. If, if you move on out you know, spreading in the, in the other areas. I think there's critical issues, there's critical issues for our district and there's critical issues for our county. When I, when I look at our district and I look at our county, I, I, I look at unemployment level and I look, at, I look at poverty level and I look at per capita income and I'll share those numbers with you in just a second. But the way I look at us getting out of that, getting out of those uh, poverty, in, decrease our poverty and, and, and increase our per capita is through economic development. We will do it through, we'll do it through better paying jobs and additional jobs throughout right, the area. What are the keys to economic development? You know, Jeffrey, what's the keys to economic development? This is, these are the keys to economic development. I look at economic development as a four-legged stool, okay? One of the critical legs of that stool is education. We've got to have a great education system. Nobody wants to move to an area that does not have to provide great education. Not good education, great education. And we're very fortunate in this district <clears throat> that in our district consists of, for those of you that don't know this, I'm sure you did, uh, for those of you that don't know this, our district, Senate district, consists of Tattnall County, Evans County, Candler County, Bullock County, Effingham County, and Emanuel County. Okay? So throughout the district, our education programs are doing real well. We've got kids going to schools anywhere they want to. We've got kids going to Michigan. Michigan State, 
uh, no reason I said that. I like you never remember which one that you were going to say. We got kids going to Georgia, Georgia Tech. You know, actually a couple of years ago, you all may not know this in this room, never had a kid go back to MIT. Okay? All that's great and all, but they're not coming back. And why are they coming back? Because we're not giving jobs to them. We have two sons, I use this example. We have two sons. We're very fortunate we have one son here in Statesboro, other son lives in St. Mary. Why does he live in St. Mary? He's a computer engineer, he's got a job in Jacksonville. And I'll be honest with you, in this room today, we don't have the same relationship with those grandchildren that we have with grandchildren. You can't have that same relationship with people 140 miles away that you do here. So it's critical, education is critical. The other thing is transportation. We've got to have great highway. I drove on Highway 67 on that blew me away. Oh Lord, thank y'all. Thank you, State, and y'all for, for, for doing that. But, but you know, the secret to bringing people into the community is transportation. Having four lane highways and having interstate schools. <clears throat> the other thing, the other key to that, a leg on that stool, remember four legged stool? The other key to the leg on that stool is health care. We've got to make sure that. We're a community right here in Bullock County. We got great health care and we got great access to health care. But we need to make sure that these other communities in this district have great access to health care. We need to make sure, Walter, that, that these rural hospitals stay open. And it's not just about bottom line. I'm a CPA. I understand numbers very well. I understand, I understand the income and I understand balance sheets. So to me, it's not just about bottom line. It's about providing access to health care. And provide, and if we don't provide access to healthcare, people don't move there. Nobody wants to live in communities that have to get, get, get access to healthcare. And now we've learned for a long time. I used the term three stools, three legs on the stool. Now I'm using four legs on the stool. So I'm using four legs on the stool, and that fourth leg is broadband. Okay, we've got to have broadband throughout this whole district. You know, Joy and I was coming back from a, a meeting in Lake Lanier the other day and, and ended up having to stop at a huddle house in uh, Louisville, Georgia, eat lunch about one thirty. There were three children there working doing the homework at, at the huddle house in, in, in Louisville. And part of it was because their mothers were waitresses there. We gotta get all that back in school and we gotta have broadband to help these children out. I can't imagine how far these children are gonna be behind. Many of y'all heard a guy by the name, by the name of Quinn Stuber talk when he came to the stage for a few, I guess seven months ago with, uh, with Chairman Thomas right here. And Quentin Stuber said, I can measure the success of a community by how well their children read at the kindergarten level. Not first grade, second grade, the kindergarten level, how successful a community is. So we need, to, we, we, need, we need to be thinking about it. And we need to be thinking about better being jobs for our community. We need to be thinking about more jobs for our community uh, so we can keep our people here instead of moving back. And so what, what happens is if, if our children move away, Fred, our grandchildren move away. Our grandchildren move away, our great-grandchildren move away. We got four counties in this district that are losing population. We're very fortunate. Bullock County is not one of those four. Edham County is not one of those four. But the other four are losing population. And why is that? Because there's not job opportunities for, for the children to be there. Let me throw out some numbers to you. And these come out of Georgia Trend Magazine, and Tom and I have talked about this a good bit over years, is that per capita income, what's per capita income? Per capita is per person. The per capita income, average per capita income for the state of Georgia is 46,482, okay? The, there's no county in our district, in the six counties I named off to you, that you can meet average per capita income. Not even average. And I don't know about y'all, but when I go to Longhorn, I don't want an average state. I want a great state. I don't want a below average state. I want a great state. We don't need these seven for average and below average. We need these seven. We need to be looking for the best and we need to be striving for the best. So keep in mind, Georgia average 46,042, okay? Emanuel County, 32,000. 14,000 below. Cameron County, 31,000. 15,000 below state average. Effingham County, and we all know what's going on in Effingham, a lot of that's because they're so close to the ground. Almost 42,000. They're only $4,000 below the state average. Okay? I'm going to get the bullet in just a minute, so I'm keeping y'all in suspense. Evans County, 35,000. Hatton County, 
Jack Hill's home, 28,000 dollars. 28,000 versus 46,000. You brothers said. Louis County, 32,000. And everybody says, well, that's because of Georgia Southern, that's because it's good. But, you know, but we can't get, and I think now Benji, when I was talking to Benji, they, they are starting to do a study time to really quantify those numbers. But those numbers are critical because if somebody picked up a Georgia Trend magazine in Atlanta or Freddie in New York and they see that, say that we're $32,000 and the state average is 46, they don't want to move here because these people can't afford to be here. So it's critical that, that and we wonder sometimes why, why industries and all don't come to our areas and why different businesses don't come to our areas. And they see these numbers and they say, well, they can't afford us, okay? Well, it's important that we work hard to bring the jobs in here so we can afford it, okay? Think about those numbers I just gave you and then let me give you the poverty rates in the county, okay? Every county in this district is double digit poverty. Every county in the district I just think is double digit poverty. Okay? The lowest is Eckham County, 10%. Okay? That means one in 10, 10%. Okay? Gannon County, 24%. One in four. Gannon County, 22%. One in four. Eddie County, 26%. One in four. Uh, Amanda County, 29%. One in three. One in three people. Or poverty level. Look, so what is poverty level? I'll tell you what we'll just say. What is poverty? Poverty level, according to Google, when I do with the other night, poverty level is for a person making twelve thousand dollars a year. Twelve thousand four hundred and ninety dollars. And and we don't know, I don't know many people that make that, to be honest with you. Yeah. So that's not the world I live in, but the numbers are definitive and that's what we need to work on. Okay. Bullet County, twenty-eight percent. Twenty-eight percent of our people in Bullet County or poverty level below. I'm not very proud of that. That's not a place that I grew up. That's not a place that I want to live. I want our people to be better. And work with y'all and work with the family y'all. We, we're going to do this. We're going we're gonna to make some things happen. Just think about, and I'll go back to my first cap income level, Tom. I did this last night. If I, if, if this is true, and our first cap income level is 32000 and the state average is 46000 that's 14000 Fourteen thousand dollars difference. If you take the fourteen thousand and multiply it times eighty thousand population, we have a potential of over one billion dollars of additional revenue for our county if we would just up credit the state average. One billion dollars of additional revenue for our county if we would just up the state average. It's amazing. It's amazing when you dig into the numbers. Okay. Uh, so let's just take those numbers and kind of digest them. And then, like I said. Think about the population base. Every county and district is, is losing population except for bullet. Um, obviously, I want better pension. I'd like for us to have better pension. And we can do that. We can all work together. We're already working together. I've already gone to Atlanta and make commitment to mutual economic development. <clears throat> I've been to the ports. Um, one time, actually going next week again to tour the ports, talking about the situation. So we need, to, we need to come together as communities, and we need to come together as leaders and start working together for better paying jobs for our area, okay? And we have to think about the next generation and the next generation, next generation. You know, we are so fortunate to live in a community that we got the George Southern, we got the Deacher Tech, we got the East Georgia College, and our district, we got Southeastern Tech. And, and I don't know if we're leveraging those, those programs like we need to leverage them. You know, I don't know what y'all know, but I'm sure some of you do that, that Georgia Southern has got the only Manufacturing engineering degree in the state of Georgia. Just take a look at the only manufacturing engineering degree within 500 miles is out here in Georgia Southern. Manufacturing engineering, and that's what we're trying to get is more and more manufacturing jobs coming back. So, so, and, and we know we've heard the numbers in Georgia Southern is a, is a billion dollar economic impact to us. Um, so that's a big thing. You know, the turn has been a turn over years called think outside the box. I think we need to be thinking inside the box. We need to figure out what we've got and deal with what we've got and try to figure out how to make it better. And we can do, we can do that as a community. I've heard, and you know, some of y'all have heard me say this many times, uh, I, I always give credit to Kenny Stone that told me this. Three types of people in the world. 
just really freak out the people world. People that make things happen, people that watch things happen, and people that wonder what happens. Okay? And we need to be people that make things happen. So it's our responsibility for the next generation created to be there. You know, if you look at the numbers and Tom and I talked about these numbers the other day, and I, he's, he's frustrated with them the way I'm frustrated with them. And if, if you think about the per capita income I gave you a few minutes ago, when you think about the poverty rate, and let's move to the to the uh, uh, census rate, people complying with the census. Now I think it's all about attitude, it's about uh, education and that type of thing. Right now, I checked those nine. Um, as of October 16, 2020, the state average for people complying with the census was 62.8%. Uh, Canada County, 53%. Bullock, 53%. The Manual, 51. Evans, 48. Tatler, 43. Effingham, 66. What did I tell you a few minutes ago? Effingham got the highest per capita income. Yeah. Uh, they, they supply the census higher than anybody else. Tackle County got lowest per capita income. They the lowest census cut. It's this relationship there that we, that's a mindset that we got to get these people, get, get these people past that. The highest in the state of Georgia is Fayetteville, Georgia, Roy. 77% of the people in Fayetteville. Somebody made them aware of the need for it. Okay, and we all know that's what the growth and all for The lowest in the state of Georgia uh, as of the night, it's Hancock County, Florida, Georgia, 26%. 26%. People just not, not aware of it. So I'll, I'll close by saying this. Uh, I really thank you a lot. Education is a big passion of mine, Jackie. I know that education will, will cure a lot of these situations. Um, I, I really want to see, and I'm going to work with all the board of education. I've already met with several of the uh, superintendents. Um, I want to see more male teachers in the school board. I want to see more male teachers in kindergarten, in first grade, in second grade, in first, third, and fourth, you know. Because a lot of these kids that we well know, <coughs> they need those role models to comply with, okay? And we all know that teaching is not as popular as it was at one time. We all know when we go to Georgia Southern and we, and we go to graduation, you know, when I teach at Georgia Southern, it was by far the highest, I'm sure, St. Mary Roy, it was by far the highest and when people write to the teachers, it's not like that anymore. Why is that not like that? We need to figure it out. We need to figure it out. And and and, and, and the quality of the education act that we're under right now is it was put in place in 1985 and we're still doing the same rules in it now that we're getting in 85. And let me tell y'all, what I've seen in teachers I've talked to, this the student of today is not the same student that was in 1985. Okay. In 1985, I was using a pay phone. Today I'm using a cell phone. But we have we have education has not changed those things. So thank y'all again for allowing me to be here. I, I really look forward to it. I'm excited about it. I think y'all know uh, this is the first I've been at this podium many times. First time I've been at this podium at your state senator. And I thank you and, and, and God bless y'all. Thank you. appreciate all of those facts and figures and pointing out that we all have some work to do and hopefully we can address it and, and uh, maybe the next time you come that we can see a different report that things are changing and going up but we certainly appreciate your, your coming thank you sir now we're going to move into our general agenda now. and to the <clears throat> to the commissioners we're going to change something a little bit we're going to take and, and we'll go through the procedure when we have action to take. But rather than I calling for a show of hands on the motion, as far as how, how you're voting, we're going to call a roll and you will vote individually. So um, maybe we, this is an experiment just to see if it, if, if it helps. Um, it does not necessarily mean we'll stick with this, but it's, it's an experiment that we're going to try. So we're going to move into our general agenda next. And before I entertain a motion to approve the general agenda, do we have any changes that need to be made by the county manager or commissioners? Will the chairman yield the floor to the county manager, please? Yes, sir. Thank you. 
Um, there's one uh, item that was omitted out of new business that we probably should have thought of uh, before the agenda was issued. However, uh, our next regularly scheduled meeting is going to be November 3rd, and that's election night. And what I would like to do is just add, add an item number two uh, to new business for your convenience to discuss whether or not we uh, either want to postpone or, or reschedule that meeting. Thank you very much. And um, so, any commissioners have a change? Then I need a motion to approve the general agenda. Chairman, I move we approve the general agenda. Second. May I have a second? Now, Mrs. Gaines, would you call the, this is for the vote for each. Commissioner individually. Commissioner Rushing, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Stranger, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Gibson, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Mosley, how do you vote? Yes. Chairman, the vote is unanimous. A unanimous decision, and thank you all very much. We're going to move on now to public comments. Is there anyone in the audience that has any public comments that they would like to make? If so, now's the time to do so. Step to the podium, state your name and address, and then what's on your mind. Yes, the five minutes to the very end of the meeting, the five minutes that people have? This is it. Okay. This okay. is it. And it's actually It's actually four minutes. Oh, four minutes? Okay. That's good. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'd like to say, um, let me get this done here. My name is Ann Gleason, and I'm running for state representative from District 158. And actually, I've met Mr. Senator, no, Senator Hickman, um, at a forum a couple months ago that we were both in. Um, I, would actually am in agreement with a lot he was saying about financial issues. We just have, I'm sure, a slightly different understanding of how to get there, but I would like to work with him because I see it's true. Transportation's a big issue in this area, and there are wonderful transit systems in Savannah, in Augusta, and if we could meet up with those, I think a lot of people who currently do not have full-time employment could go to a place that's a little bit larger during the day, get the full-time employment, come back home, pay taxes, be able to bring in revenue for the counties. Um, I see there, as far as like the broadband issue, um, we I know a long time depended on fiber optic cables, which is kind of a cumbersome and expensive way to go about it. I think if we just change maybe how we're actually going about getting internet access going by say modal points it could be achieved but we just need to change how we're how we're going about it now versus how we were going about it in 2002 um so i but the main focus of actually my campaign is i would like to see medicaid expansion in the state because as you were saying the rural hospitals are having a hard time staying around and also there are a lot of people that do not receive the health care that they need. For instance, like myself, I, there is before the Affordable Care Act, I could not have um, received, say, the annual MRI that I received because I have multiple sclerosis. And that led me to be able to find out I had a brain aneurysm, and then I was able to go into immediate surgery and not die or possibly be um, irreversibly harmed by um, rupturing of the aneurysm, because I'm sure I would have found out the hard way when it ruptured it, because that's how most people find out they have aneurysm. And I look at so many people like in the area I live in, I'm from Jenkins County, and I'm sure this is an extent, you see this also in Bullock County. There are a lot of people walking around taking time bombs, and they don't know about them, because they don't reliably see one doctor, maybe, Every now and then they go to the emergency room or, the, or a clinic and they see
see one doctor and then they get a referral to get testing that they possibly cannot afford to get. So in a way, there's little served by actually even going to that one doctor that they'll see once in their life at that clinic. So I would um, greatly appreciate your, your all support. If you live in District 158, please do consider Ann P. Gleason. I'm the Democrat on the ticket. So and thank you very much. And I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I'm glad that you all actually were meeting today because I know early election is going on, but I did want to meet everyone before before actually November 3rd. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Finley, would you like to debate either one of these two commissioners here today, tonight, or politicians? <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, thank you all for coming. And uh, now we're going to, anyone else, now's the time for public comments. Last call. Okay, we're going to move on to the consent agenda. We have three items on the consent agenda and it's all pertaining to minutes. Um, we have any discussion on it? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we uh, approve this consent agenda as if. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Ms. Gaines, would you call for the vote, please? Commissioner Rushing, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Stranger, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Gibson, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Mosley, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, unanimous. Thank you very much. Unanimous approval. <clears throat> now we'll move into new business. We have two items on the new business. And the first one <clears throat> is amendment for the fiscal year 2021 budget for annual leave cash out. Tom, I believe you're going to discuss this for us. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Very briefly, um, we, we did have some brief discussion of this at the last re regular meeting. As you recall, the uh, fiscal 21 budget resolution and the general appropriations budget did not include uh, general cost of living allowances, performance adjustments, or other performance uh, or other uh, types of raises. And in addition to that. Mm -hmm. um, pursuant to our personnel policies. We also have a provision for annual leave cash outs for eligible employees for up to um, 40 hours. However, um, because of the, but, uh, the original budget resolution, uh, we're asking uh, today that you consider an authorizing resolution uh, to amend the passage on uh, page 409 of the general appropriations budget document to allow uh, the vacation cash outs, but in this particular case, as we spoke at the last meeting, uh, due to our financial position, we're recommending 50 hour, hours instead of the traditional 40. Uh, we think there's some compelling reasons to do this. First of all, given the pandemic fatigue, uh, we think it would be good for employee morale in lieu of the general raises. Second, it would remove some lead time liabilities on our balance sheet which were impacted by the COVID-19 lead policies that the board passed last spring that offered um, additional lead beyond the uh, FFCRA. And third, it would some, uh, also put some money into the local economy, which I think is, is good. So having said all that, um, I'll yield the floor back to the chairman and we ask you to take consideration of this authorizing resolution. If you have any questions or comments, uh, we're at your disposal. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I also would like to add to remind y'all, and I know every one of you know, we have the best employees anywhere. And I think this was, would be a super way to show them um, that we do appreciate what they do and the amount of work that they that they do and uh, keeping this county strong. And so, you know, open it up any discussion that we might have on this matter. <clears throat> Hearing none, then I'm going to call for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve. We have a motion, we have a second. 
to a call for the vote, please. Commissioner Gresham, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner <coughs> Stranger, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Gibson, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Mosley, how do you vote? Yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Item number two is should we change our next meeting date since our next meeting is scheduled for election night? Um, so I think we, Tom, do. Well, um, my recommendation would be uh, we may want to change the date rather than uh, not have the meeting because uh, we're just at that stage of maturation as a local government where we always seem to have some um, more immediate business to take care of. Uh, the good news is uh, at, at this particular meeting, there are no uh, zoning related hearings scheduled or other hearings that, that I'm aware of. So if we did have to have the meeting, it would uh, probably be for some routine business. But, uh, you know, the elect election day is going to be very busy. Uh, I myself, not that my presence in the meeting matters, I've pledged to our election supervisor that I would spend the day with her on election day, so I will be sufficiently worn out from that. But uh, having said that though, and for those people, those of you uh, who may want to vote in person on that, that particular day, um, I feel like there isn't any business that we couldn't defer to to another day, provided that you all agree to change the rate part of the day. I guess it just comes down to uh, when do you want to change it? You know, just the thought, if you wanted to move it to the preceding Monday night, you know, Wednesday night, there's a lot of people who uh, attend church services and that may not be feasible. Or they may have um, post-traumatic stress disorder from the election on Wednesday. But, um, if, on the other hand, if you if you all have an alternative day, uh, that's at your discretion. But uh, I, re I merely recommend moving it because of election day. Okay, thank you. I'll open this up for discussion. Um, does anybody have a preference as far as the date? You know, <coughs> this is true. Yeah. We've done it both ways in the past, so has other counties. I think it'd be better to move it up one day. Election be over, people are mind to be on this election like it's been the last six or eight months. And uh, I just think it'd be a better, smoother, easier moving up one day and of course then you can talk about the results. If you want to we'll go from there, that's just my opinion. Anyone else? I was gonna say it doesn't matter to me either way. I'll move it off the Democrat. The Monday before would be Move to the Monday instead of the Tuesday before would be good. Okay. And just for clarity, the, the Monday before meaning Monday night before the two, Tuesday the election? Second. Oh, the November second Tuesday. November 2nd. Oh, November 2nd. I'm sorry. Thank you. November 2nd. Okay. I would uh, recommend, Mr. Chairman, since we are moving the meeting and the, meet, and the regular meetings are part of our code of ordinances, um, I, I'd recommend uh, asking for motions and a subsequent vote on this item, please. Yes, we have, I guess, two dates that have been mentioned, and I too would like to keep it off of Wednesday. So, Mr. Gibson, with November the 2nd, that's by you also. That's on a Monday after the election. No, Monday before. before. Monday before the election. Yes, seconds on Monday. Elections on the third. I just had another engagement Monday night. That's the reason I suggested Wednesday. I think you will be fine. Okay, that's uh, okay. Then, um, hearing no motion on the second day of the meeting, then I'm going to call for a um, a motion. I'll make a motion that we move our next our first meeting in November to November the second Monday instead of November the third. Okay. Comes 
The second building I want to talk about is the uh, train building. This is the one closest to Highway 301 that you see out there. Um, I got a, an elevation for you so you can see so you can see what the finished product should look like. Although you can, there's a pretty good uh, example out there now. The buildings come pretty far. Just included an extra picture for you of the inside. This was taken probably about a month ago, so um, they've probably come a, a good way since then. But if you can imagine, it's just one large open room where they're going to have, uh, I guess, longer tables for training. They have a projector. Um, so yeah, if you got any questions about that, then just let me know. But that was a pretty simple, easy open shelf. The evidence building is the one with dock lodge. This is the one that I just mentioned had the drainage issues to the other side of it. Um, this is, as you can see, yes, as you can see, um, where you see all the, the construction products that are kind of sitting in there on that right picture, that's one of the bays. Um, basically, they'll be able to draw their vehicles into there, close the doors, and process that, that vehicle for evidence. So there's two bays there. All right, the last building is the booking and intake building. This is the building that's behind the existing jail. So this is where they'll process inmates as they come in. This is just an elevation of what it should look like. And you can see the valley port. And this is where it was about a month ago. Um, I think they've since gotten a roof, maybe. I believe they have. Um, but as you can see, it's in the very, very back. You can't see it from the road. The picture on your right is the actual booking area with the holding cells. Um, all of those doorways will be holding cells with a, with a general booking area in the middle. All right, these are just pictures of hallways with more holding cells. And then the corridor that connects over to the existing jail now. Again, this, this is kind of a little bit further along since I took these pictures. All right, any questions about the jail before I move on to public works? Okay. All right, so the public works uh, relocation entrance, as you know, we're moving them from the lodge uh, to a newer building that, that is being constructed now. Um, the sheriff's office is going to take the lodge over when that happens. Um, so, let's see. You can, okay, so looking at this picture here, if you can imagine Highway 301 is where my pointer is. It's a little bit further over, but it's where my pointer is. So, so back in the back here is where Public Works currently stores their vehicles under this shelter. And as you can, if you recall, we bought some property on Highway 301 at the top of the bypass, I guess a year or two ago, so that we could um, get a new entrance into there. So if you can follow my planner, the new entrance will come through here. All right, again, just another elevation of what it should look like. This is just a, an aerial view of the new entrance so that you have more of a better idea of, of what I'm saying. So we brought the, we bought this property in this, this area a while back with hopes of getting an entrance into here. We contacted GDOT um, back then to make sure that we would be okay with getting an entrance out off of that area since there is a traffic signal there. And at the time, it was um, going to be perfectly fine. There were no issues with it. Um, should have been that, that big of a call. So we did buy the property, and we have since learned, um, as we were trying to get the encroachment permit from GDOT, that their traffic signals are currently non-conforming. And because of that, they would like us to replace all the traffic signals and add turning lanes, which are surprises to us. So we were working through that process right now. Um, so that's, all, that's also kind of the reason why we kept this project separate from the jail. We knew that this one was going to go a little bit slower um, on top of a different funding source. So again, this is just, just a, another illustration of that entrance. Your traffic signals are here, bypass is here. This will be the new entrance, and this is the new public works building. And of course, the goal is to keep them separated from public safety. We would have a whole different entrance so that we wouldn't have trucks continuously coming in and out of the public safety area. All right, this is a picture of the building. The building picture was taken yesterday, so that's what it looked like yesterday. Um, the interior was taken about a month ago, so that's probably come a little bit further, but you're looking at a reception or office area. Just more of the inside. I'm thinking that that is a kitchenette area. And then we've got some hallways with lots of offices. So 
they're getting huge upgrades, it's much larger than where they are now. Be, be much more friendly to the public. All right, any questions about public works before I move on? Okay, so we'll move on to uh, SNS Greenway Phase 3. Um, you're all aware that we got a grant from the TAP program to design this project. We got a $300,000 grant. Um, let's see. So we're going to extend the trail from the existing roundabout at Burt Hawthorne and Victoria Rushing all the way into downtown Brooklyn. So I'll just go through and show you kind of where we are. So again, $300,000 grant to 75-25 match. We should have no issues meeting that match. That would be a $75,000 match, and uh, we're going we're gonna to hit well above that, so we should be fine there. Um, we're currently working through the federal stages of this project. Um, that's very timely, so it draws it out a bit. There are lots of environmental documents that have to be reviewed and filed and reviewed again, so that takes a while, but um, I was just, just pointing out that Heaton Lineback has the contract for design at $747,000. Um, I've been submitting reimbursements for every pay request that we get from the grant. Um, so as you can see in the, in the tiny spreadsheet to the right, um, our total out of pocket at the moment is $47,000, although we've had pay requests for two hundred and twelve. dollars so the grant has been helping. Um, the schedule is we are expected to solicit bids in fall of 2021 with construction being in 2022. Again, that seems like a long time, and it is because it's a federal grant, and that's how they do things. So, um, again, that we're excited about it. We're gonna. Oh, sorry, I almost left that. We're also gonna design for um, Josh Hagen Road to be paved. Um, we think that the user experience would be greater if they're not running next to us uh, or walking next to us. So, um, that's that's happening in parallel. I'll keep you guys updated on that as it as it continues. We're not too far in that right now kind of focusing on the trail as much as possible. Um, another one of the federal requirements is to have a public meeting. So we will be doing that shortly. Um, the thought process is to maybe have it in Brooklyn for an entire day and try to split up sections of the trail uh, so that if, if you live along the trail or you own property abutting the trail, you come during your specified time period so that we can limit the amount of people that come. But that will be upcoming and you'll be notified as soon as, as, soon as that date set. So instead of showing you the entire trail, I just wanted to show you where the trailheads are. Um, so this area is, of course, the roundabout. So it shows you, gives you an idea of where, which side of the road the trail is going to be on. So it comes across, goes behind the existing solid waste station, and it, if you're going towards Brooklyn, it is on the left-hand side of Josh Hagen. All right, the second trailhead intersects Grimshaw Road. And as you, you might not be able to see it too good if you well they zoomed in on that for you, but there's a tobacco barn there that if, if you guys want to give some thought into how we might be able to reuse that, that would be great. Um, but in the meantime, we do plan to have a smaller trailhead there. We've had discussions about a parklet area so that um, maybe people can hang out there, have some picnics. Um, but again, it, it, if you can think about some uses for the barn, I think that would be a really neat idea for the area and it would help preserve some of the historical functions that we have. And the last trailhead is in downtown Brooklyn. Um, so it's right behind the church. As you can see, this will be a bigger trailhead, much bigger than the one at Grimshaw. Um, but this is where the trail will end. Um, and just so you know, we have met the mayor of Brooklyn. He is familiar with all of this, so any of the comments or questions or concerns that we get, I'm trying to include them in it, so feel free to also reach out to them if you have any, any questions. And then quickly, this is just, just an illustration of what it would look like, sort of more of a, I guess, 2D illustration, but I tried to show you Brooklyn, if you're heading towards Brooklyn versus Statesboro, what it would look like. So you got Josh Hagen Road and then the trail on the other side. This is the farmland section, so that Grimshaw section that I just showed you. And then this is the Brooklet section. So you're, again, you're headed towards downtown, State Square is on the other end, the trail is now on the right side. Any questions about the trail? I promise I'm almost done. From, from Ken Kelly at the trailhead into Brooklet, 
How long is that total? It is 4.1 miles, I believe. Okay. 4.5, sorry. Okay. Do we have to get right away on the road there, Cindy, on Josh Hagen? Yeah, at the moment, there's not any anticipated right away, but I will tell you that as far as trail goes, the federal guidelines have us, has it looking like we're going to get a lot of right away. But in the end, once, once we, all the studies are done, we shouldn't have to get any. As far as Josh Hagen, I don't think Brad's not in here, but I think we determined that it was Tommy who might think correct me if I'm wrong. Brad is here. Um, but I think we determined we have enough. Yeah, we're good. Um, I would say, I think from Gentilly to the roundabout, it's 2.1 miles, and it might be 4.5 from the roundabout to downtown oh, Brooklyn. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I just. <coughs> It, we'll, we'll have about six or seven miles uh, along that trail, which I I think will be a good feature for people who want to use bikes. Any other questions for the trail? All right. This is the last one that I'm going to go into a lot of detail on, and this is just because if you're asked about it, or I just feel like this might be something that you might want to talk about if you, if you ever have to present anything, but. Hopefully the color is better on your screen than it is on my computer right now, but this is a um, grant that we received from Welcome to Georgia. Um, it's a GDOT grant, and it was in the amount of $35,000 um, plus a little bit of change. Um, we received this grant to do some landscaping improvements. Uh, you might remember a couple years ago we did something similar off of the I-16 grant. Um, it's, it's just to help with um, attracting people to stop and so we received that grant, we received bids last week for the installation. Typically, we would have the recreation department do the installation. Um, they are slammed. So we're gonna use, we're gonna take advantage of this grant and use that to help with the installation as well. So we received bids last week. They're, um, we're very pleased with them. You should be seeing those on the November agenda soon. Um, but just to kind of orient you a little bit, these are the I-16 exits here. I think there's not sliding like it should, but so this is coming from Macon. You would get off the airport Statesboro. Uh, well, if you were driving in the wrong direction, I guess you would. But anyway, and then Savannah goes this way. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm sure I have this confused you. Okay, any questions on that one specifically? All right. So you should see it getting um, a facelift shortly. So we're excited about that. All right, so just some other projects. Um, I won't go through every one. I think at, most people are familiar with the roads and engineering projects that are happening now. Um, Cypress Lake Road is one that everybody's interested in. We're expecting the construction to begin in November. I think they're gearing up for it now. Um, there's some road paving, striping signage. Um, there are some renovations happening at uh, fire departments, at the various fire departments and EMS. Um, and then I believe recreation departments working on some site fencing at the Ag Arena. We are currently in the process of talking about some things happening out at Fletcher Trail Park. Um, so hopefully that'll be Fletcher Park Trail, sorry. Hopefully that'll come shortly. And then of course the airport um, always has some GDOT and FAA projects happening, but any of those specifically that you want to talk about, we have to answer any questions. Anybody got any questions? Yeah. As always, thank you for the report. I see it done, and, and uh, you know, this is, a lot of this is T-splash dollars at work. Yes, sir. A lot of it is, especially the SNS trail extension. That is <clears throat> the catalyst.
And I do want to mention that I think we're still trying to be, you know, cautious about our uh, budget projections for fiscal 21, even though we made the change with the um, uh, employee annual leave cash outs. Um, we, even though I think things are going pretty good right now, um, we're sort of on track, but uh, we may be seeing little bits of additional revenue here and there, but uh, with the COVID situation always being fluid, uh, unless a couple of good things happen, we still may have a planned deficit like we had, for, had planned for the fiscal 21 budget. However, if everybody remains to be frugal, uh, you know, maybe that deficit can uh, either be contained or we, we can be a little bit closer to evening out. The good news is, as um, we've reported before, if uh, pending the, the final audit, last year's surplus uh, puts us in a very favorable financial condition to sustain you know, the planned deficit and the use of, the use of fund balance if we need it. So uh, I don't want to say bad news necessarily, but I, I just think we still need to be you know, cautious in, until we get into later in the year and see how our revenue performance ultimately is. I think our insurance premium tax money came in above, about three to four percent above uh, what we had projected, and which is good because um, we basically just tried to follow some state estimates and um, we hope we'll have a, re a favorable uh, check coming from the hospital authority which I think we'll know at the end of the month how much that figure is. They gave us an estimate which is uh, considerably above what, what we estimated. We were trying to play the markets a little bit because you know they invest in some equities, but um, if they come through with uh, what they say, that, that may get us maybe close to another 150,000 to the good or better. But um, right now we're doing okay, surprisingly. Anyone have any questions? If not, then we're going to move into our staff report for comments. Uh, any staff members have any comments? I just had one. This is an award that we received um, recently. I don't know if you wanted to mention that as well. It's, you heard a lot of screaming in the hallways working for one day a couple weeks ago. But we were awarded the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. Uh, the GFOA and we are one of 19 counties in Georgia that has both the Distinguished Budget Award and this for our CAFR as well and so that's just as kudos to our finance team. Whitney helped a good bit. Christy probably helped more than any of us putting this together and so this is a, a great uh, award for us and professionalizing our financial reporting and budgeting but one of 19 counties and, and talking to Christy we may be one of the very few who actually did that this uh, pre prepare this all by ourselves. A lot of folks will hire their uh, auditors when they do this for them, but we did this in house, and so that's a great um, significance of the, the good team that we have here. So I just want to thank the finance team for putting that together this year. Will we receive a certificate, an official certificate? We did. We have a certificate. We have it now. Mm -hmm. I would actually like to put that on an agenda to maybe even have. We can come back also with Christian here and whomever. Um, so, to make a formal recognition at that time, if that's the will. We'll see if, if uh, we can put that on a night meeting. I know Whitney you better mm -hmm. coming at night. Okay. Thank you for that report. Um, the, any other staff member? Again, we'll move it to commissioners. Um, the commissioners have any comments to make? I just want to thank all our staff. That just shows how what we always say that we have the greatest staff of anybody, any county in the state of Georgia, I think. And uh, it's just great to have them supporting us and giving us the information that we can, so we can use to make good decisions. And uh, it makes us look good, but it's always the staff that does the work. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. I also want to concur with that and that, you know, I was listening to Tom a few minutes ago and Andy and then I look back there and just Christy King is now our new CFO. Whitney has moved to, I'm moving on, I think, to South Carolina. And um, so we, we do know that Chris is going to do a great job and then with some new employees with the finance department. And, and uh, you know, it's the advice. I was listening to Tom a few minutes ago about Buller County and the advice that they give us do make it easy for us to make the decisions. And uh, you know, still Buller County is, gosh, I've lived here all my life. But I don't want to go anywhere else. I still think it's the best county anywhere to live. So uh, if you don't live here, maybe you need to consider moving here. So um, the having said all of that, um, do we have a motion to adjourn if there's nothing else? I so move, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion, we have a second. I'm gonna make this one short. All those in favor of adjournment, show of hands. Okay. Meeting adjourned. Thank you all for coming.